Welcome back. We're still just continuing um, lecture two of our um, crash course in computational hydrodynamics. Um, so we're on to um, dealing with nonlinear solutions, and we're on um, where we came to this conclusion that uh, our waves would steepen and therefore shock. And so we're trying to rewrite our equations to be able to deal with um, nonlinear with discontinuous um, solutions. So just to recap, um, we got our uh, our equations in in a conserv in an integral form, so where we have the ddt of the mass integral over a volume, for example, equals the minus um, the rho v, um, which is the flux of mass through the surface. We have the same thing with our momentum, so this is um, delta v, so ddt of integral of rho v dv um, equals minus the integral over the surface area. Um, this is a pi um, plus rho v v um, dot ds, and I have just gone off the end of the surf the edge of the board there. Uh, that's a dot ds. I'll try not to do it again. So we have a ddt of the rho times energy d volume. Uh, so that's the energy per unit volume rather than the energy per unit mass, which is the e which is the integral over the surface of rho e plus p v dot ds. Okay, so we've got our equations in our integral form. Um, so that enables us to deal with um, discontinuous solutions. So the integral form of the equations they imply that it's basically the flux of uh, mass, momentum, and energy um, that must be equal across a jump. So what do we mean by a jump? So let's consider um, so, for example, let's consider um, a one-dimensional 1D jump or shock. So, a simple um, one-dimensional um, jump in the primitive variables. So, imagine there's a jump in density, velocity, um, and thermal energy. So, that's a rho, v, and u. So let's just imagine there's a place, this is the x direction, and then at some point, uh, which call this x equals x shock, uh, there's a jump from rho 1, v1, and u1 on the left hand side uh, to rho 2, uh, v2, and u2. And what we want to find is the boundary condition here on this surface. So this is um, you now just, I mean, just a one dimensional line, but we've got a um, this is what you call a shock tube because literally in the lab, um, what they used to do was they used to make a little like actual tube, well they still do, and they have a little membrane separating the two um, regions and so they would have some high temperature, uh, high density fluid on one side and low temperature, low, um, low density, low temperature fluid on another or sort of vacuum. And they would basically shoot out this membrane and the flow would just propagate into the right half of the tube. So there's a famous experimental problem as well as being a theoretical problem. Um, and so the thing that we have got from our equations is that, for example, the mass flux, which here is rho 1 v1, um, must equal rho 2 v2 um, into the right-hand side. And so it's the same with the thing with our other variables. And this leads us to what are known as the shock jump conditions. So the fact that these fluxes must be equal across our surface um, leads us to the rankin hujonio sorry for my French pronunciation, um, I apologize for anybody international or who speaks French or um, just the whole world in general for my pronunciation here. So this leads us um, to what I call the Rankine, Rankin, 
I'll try not to abuse this. Ooh, Gornio. Um, jump conditions. So for a a one day plane parallel shock. And those are simply uh, these conditions here. So this is the flux of mass, the flux of momentum, and the flux of energy. And those just simply have to be equal across the front. So we have row one v one equals row two v two. This is our jump condition number one. We have p one plus row one v one squared. Now this is v one squared because uh, we're in one dimension. This should be a row. Uh, you can't really see it because I haven't written it on the board properly. But this is a row. Uh, v, V here, but we're in one dimension, so the only thing here we have is a Vx and a Vx, uh, so that's just a Vx squared, effectively. Um, and again, this um, unit matrix here just gives us Xx, so that's why we just get a pressure plus a row 1, V1 squared. And the right-hand side is just the same flux of momentum on the right-hand side, row 2, V2 squared, and that's equation 2. Uh, and the energy um, gives us the following. Um, well, let's let's work out our energy a little bit more slowly. Uh, so we get a rho e plus p, but that is equal to um, a rho, basically half v squared plus u. Um, so it's a half rho v squared plus rho u plus p. Uh, and that is equal to a half rho v squared plus, um, this is a, remember if we use gamma p equals gamma minus one rho u, uh, then this is going to give us a uh, gamma minus one rho u plus uh, one, so it's going to give us simply a gamma p on um, gamma minus one. All right, so then our energy jump condition simply becomes, I'll write it underneath the other one, so our energy jump condition simply becomes, uh, we get a half v1 squared um, plus gamma p1 on gamma minus 1 rho 1 equals just the same on the right hand side, so it's half v2 squared plus gamma p2 on gamma minus 1 uh, rho 2. So this is our jump condition number three. So we've got a mass, momentum, and energy flux that have to be equal on both sides of the shock front. Now, we have to be careful here. So um, just be careful. These assume that the shock is not moving. So um, if the shock was moving, um, stationary shock, not the one you buy in office works. Um, but we can combine them to learn some basic physics. Um, well, learn about what happens at a shock front. And um, spoiler alert, uh, it's going to be related to what I discussed previously, which is the fact that uh, you know we essentially losing information at a shock front. And so there's going to be some irreversible process. And this, um, it's a really special thing that you can get something irreversible from a set of equations which are entirely reversible in the first place. Um, and it's because of an assumption, and it's this assumption that we're making that we're saying our fluid is not allowed to penetrate itself. So it's not allowed to have double valued solutions. Uh, and the reason that nature is like that is because of something irreversible. Um, and that's because molecules um, actually hit each other at some point. And molecules actually hitting each other, colliding, is uh, what gives you viscosity. So we're going to get a fluid um, which effectively has viscosity in it, um, but we don't care what kind of viscosity, we don't care how, we just, the mathematical statement is that when we want to make sure that the fluid is single valued. Uh, so the fluid velocity is single valued. Um, all right, so we can just start playing with these equations. Effectively, we want to find a solution for, say, example, the density jump or the velocity jump. So we just want to get rid of um, all of our unknowns and just solve for one of these um, variables. So, for example, from if we just start from one, we can rearrange 
uh, to eliminate v2, so we get v2 squared equals, um, well that's a row one uh, on row two uh, squared v1 squared. All right, so that's our expression for v2. We can now shove that into there and we can keep going. So that means that 2 gives us, for example, we can get uh, row 1 v1 squared plus p1 equals, um, we're getting a row 1 v1 squared. Uh, that's row 1 squared on row 2 because the row 2 cancels the row 1 uh, plus p2. Uh, okay, so therefore we can get an expression for P2 in terms of the one quantities. So we can get rid of P2 here. So we can say that um, P2 is simply P1 uh, plus, now the common factor is row 1 V1 squared. And that's a 1 minus uh, row 1 on row 2. Okay, so we've got an expression, so that gives us an expression to eliminate V2, this gives us an expression for eliminating P2, uh, and then we can simply use our energy equation to get, and we should be able to get a solution. Um, so we've used 1, we've used 2, we just need to use 3 now, I'm going to rub these off so we get a bit more space. And we should be able to get an expression for the density jump uh, across the shock. Okay, so from, make a bit of space, oh, except I rubbed out the last one, which was the important one there. Um, so from, from our third equation, so we can now use this one and this one, so we want to replace um, we've got a half v1 squared, um, and I'll just collect some of the terms because it's a bit of a mess. Um, but we're going to get a 1, which is the term on the left-hand side, but the term on the right-hand side is going to come back over to the left and give us a row 1 squared over row 2 squared. Uh, then we get a, no, we had a gamma p1 on row 1. And so we're going to replace that with just the sound speed 1 squared um, on gamma minus 1. Uh, and the right hand side is going to give us um, a row 1 on row 2, gamma minus 1, uh, sound speed 1 squared, plus gamma on gamma minus 1, row 1 on row 2, v1 squared, 1 minus row 1 on row 2. All right, so that's a bit of a mess, um, but we can then just clean it up and we should be able to find something helpful. So we've eliminated all of the, um, so it's only, we've only got V1s here um, and CS1s. The only um, quantity that has a 2 in it now is the density. So we're going to try and solve for the density jump here. Um, and hopefully some of you have done this before, so this should not be entirely new. Um, all right, so what do we want to do? So let's get rid of this factor of um, gamma minus 1 on the bottom. So let's multiply uh, by 2 gamma minus 1. And we're going to define a new quantity. So define a new quantity because you can see there's either a V1 or there's a sound speed. So if we simply divide v1 by the sound speed, we're going to get a dimensionless quantity called the Mach number. So let's define that the Mach number squared is v1 squared over cs1 squared. That's a definition. Uh, and let's try and clean this up. So we're then going to get, this is going to give us m1 squared. Now that 2 goes, well, we're going to get a gamma minus 1. Now let's expand this out. This is a 1 minus um, row 1 and row 2 squared. So this is a 1 minus row 1 and row 2. Um, 1 plus row 1 on row 2. Might change pens in a second. Let's do that. Uh, this term is going to give us a... Um, well, it's going to give us a... 
Uh, that's a bit weird changing pens mid flow. I'll change pens on the next screen. Uh, so we've times by two gamma minus one, we've divided the whole thing by CS squared. So this is going to simply give us uh, a two here. And that is going to be equal to, um, what's this one? So this is going to be a two gamma minus one. So this is row one on row two, uh, two. And we, this one gives us a um, two gamma row one on row two. We divided by sound speed squared, mark number squared, one minus row one on row two. Okay, um, so we can move this term to the left hand side. So let's just move that to the left. So that's a two, one minus row one on row two equals the following. And now we can cancel this term. So we can cancel this term here, here, and here. And we simply get that um, gamma minus one times the Mach number squared, um, one plus row one on row two plus two equals um, two gamma uh, Mach number one squared, row one on row two. All right, so we're nearly there. Um, okay, so we want to take this term to the right hand side. So we therefore get, uh, let's keep this one. So we get a mark number one squared at gamma minus one. That's a squared, sorry, uh, plus two. And let's take this term over to the right hand side. So that gives us a um, row one on row two m1 squared is the common factor and that gives us a 2 gamma 2 gamma and minus this term which is a minus um, gamma minus 1. Okay so this is effectively a gamma plus 1 and this gives us um, well therefore we can just simply rearrange to get the row 2 on row 1 which is the thing we were after. Now I'm going to definitely write this in a different color pen. So we get row two on row one equals um, the mark number one squared um, times gamma plus one. So that's that term and then we divide by that term. So we simply get divided by um, mark number one squared gamma minus one plus two. All right, so we've solved our shock jump conditions for the density jump across a shock. All right, so let's see what happens. Now, remember the mark number is, uh, is effectively a measure of how strong your velocity is compared to your sound speed. So I mentioned in the first part of um, this lecture on the nonlinear behavior of waves, that uh, if you remember Berger's equation was our velocity was um, essentially infinite compared to the sound speed. So that is just a purely steepening wave, um, which is entirely nonlinear from the beginning because there's no, um, there's effectively no translation of that wave um, because there's no, um, well, there's no wave because there's propagation, no propagation of the sound speed. So that has purely just the nonlinear behavior in it. Um, okay, but here we're going to see, um, so we can take the limit of Berger's equation by taking the Mach number to infinity. Uh, and if we do that, what are we going to find? So for, so for a very strong st shock, then the Mach number, um, well, it goes to infinity. And we have that row two um, on row one. Now the right way to think about this is just divide. So this is a gamma plus one. And let's divide the top and the bottom by Mach number squared. So this is a gamma minus one plus two on the Mach number one squared. Now this term goes to zero. Um, and so that simply leaves us with um, approximately gamma plus one on gamma minus one. So for example, 
for a typical case for gamma of five thirds, uh, the monatomic gas that gives us the density jump across the shock, row two on row one, is, well, what's that? Gamma plus one, so it's eight thirds over gamma minus one, so it's two thirds equals four. All right, and so therefore the velocity jump, the opposite, v2 on v1 is obviously then row, two, row one on row two from our original Rankine Neutronio conditions, which is like a quarter. So we'll come back to this, but in terms of kinetic energy, that means the kinetic energy is down by a factor of one sixteenth. So the, there's an, if we're going to conserve energy, then the only other form of energy, which is our thermal energy, must go up by a factor of sixteen. In other words, we generate a heck of a lot of heat. All right, so um, so an infinitely strong shock would produce a factor of four density jump. Now this is in a monatomic gas, so for example molecular hydrogen is a monatomic gas, uh, but air is mostly nitrogen, so for a diatomic gas, um, for example air, then gamma is uh, 1.4, and so you would get um, that the row two on row one for an infinitely strong shock would be six. So the maximum density contrast you can get from a shock in air would be six. And well, so basically the same procedure follows um, for the other jump, for the other quantities. So by similar procedure, actually just by deriving this equation and then using it um, back in your other equations again. Um, so we find, we can find the jumps in the other variables. So I'm gonna write them down, but these are a question left on your problem sheet for you to complete. Um, so this is P2 on P1. Uh, it gives us, uh, what is it, 2 gamma Mach 1 squared minus gamma minus 1 on gamma plus 1. And the temperature jump, T2 on T1, um, equals 2 gamma M1 squared minus gamma minus 1. And this is 2 plus gamma minus 1 mark number 1 squared over um, gamma plus 1 squared mark number 1 squared. So in other words, the important thing here is just looking at these equations, for the mark number goes to infinity, what do we get? So we get the pressure jump goes to infinity. Uh, and that's, well, hopefully obvious, but also that the temperature jump, T1 and T2, also goes to infinity. So that is, there's Mach numbers all over the place here, so even if you divide um, by the Mach number, you still get left with one. Um, so the temperature jump still goes to infinity as you increase the Mach number. So although the density jump is um, finite, you generate a heck of a lot of heat, so the temperature becomes infinite behind the shock. Um, and in particular, um, just saying the same thing um, the other way around, so just in terms of energy, energetically what happens at a shock, so notice that the post-shock kinetic energy is significantly lower. So for example, because V2 is one quarter, one quarter V1, so that means half V2 squared um, is one sixteenth, well it's one sixteenth of the half um, of V1 squared. So you get one sixteenth of the kinetic energy that you had before. And this implies again that a significant amount of kinetic energy has been converted into heat. And if you learn anything from your first three years of physics, is that conversion, uh, is that heat is the most useless form of energy. So this implies 
that a significant amount of, the, of kinetic energy is converted to heat. And converting energy to heat is an irreversible process. So from a set of equations which are entirely reversible, we've got something fundamentally uh, irreversible out of them. And that's one of the things that makes the fluid equation so um, tricky, is they always blow up in a finite time. And so it's one of the reasons also why it's a million dollar maths problem um, to prove, um, well to find, you know, solutions to the Navier-Stokes equations, because you get this finite time blow up. Um, so hence, basically shocks are uh, what you call dissipative, and they're very dissipative. You get one sixteenth of the kinetic energy you had before, um, and they are an irreversible process. So we're basically converting energy into irreversible forms of energy. Uh, and you can proceed from those jump conditions, so we haven't gone the full way, uh, but you can keep going to derive the full shock solution, um, which I'm not going to do because this is a crash course, and it's not particularly interesting either to define, um, but you can solve the entire problem about what happens at a shock front uh, analytically. Um, but I've simply provided a subroutine for you to calculate this solution, uh, so you can simply use that subroutine to plot some of these um, shock solutions. But essentially you get um, a wave, you get a wave propagating to the left, a wave propagating to the right, and you get the initial discontinuity. Um, okay, so I just want to cover one more topic just quickly, um, which is that of isothermal shocks. So this is the case where we've, cons uh, we've obeyed all of our conservation laws, uh, including the conservation of energy. But real life is not like that. Um, real life, uh, behind a shock, you might excite some um, some line transitions, for example, uh, if you're an astrophysical shock, and that energy generated behind the shock might simply radiate into space, and so the temperature may not change at all. So for an isothermal shock, actually the solution's pretty simple. Um, so row two on row one goes to four is for um, non-radiative shocks. So in other words, they're adiabatic, so i.e. where all the heat is trapped. So that's part of the reason why you get that limiting density contrast, is because the shock gets hot, and hot means pressure, and so that stops any further compression because of the heat that's generated. It's like when you're trying to pump a bicycle, um, you know, it's harder to pump because it gets hot, and that gives you a extra pressure in the pump. So. Um, in the case um, where there is cooling, then the density jump can be higher. So for example, uh, let's consider now the jump conditions in the following form. Just say that T2 has to be equal to T1. So this is an isothermal shock. And we've got rho 2 equals just sound speed squared rho 2. That's the isothermal equation of state, if you remember. And we've got P1 is C sound speed squared rho 2. Sound speed is now a constant because it's just the temperature, which is a constant. Uh, if you remember that sound speed squared is kBT on mu mH in this case. Um, and that would just be a constant. So for an isothermal equation of state, the sound speed is simply this combination of things. So uh, we can take our mass and momentum conservation again. So we have v2 squared equals rho 1 squared on rho 2 squared, um, squared, sorry, v1 squared. And the same thing again, we've got a p2 uh, plus rho 2 v2 squared equals p1 plus rho 1 v1 squared. And just playing the same game again, we get a rho 1 squared, uh, so we get a rho 1 squared on rho 2 squared, uh, v1 squared here, that's this term. Uh, this term gives us a cs squared rho 2, 
This term gives us a CS squared row 1, and this term gives us a row 1 V1 squared. So again, just rearranging, um, we have simply that we can divide by the sound speed. So let's divide by the sound speed. This gives us sound speed squared, sound speed squared. So that gives us our Mach number. Um, what do we get? We get something like, uh, this is a Mach number squared. And let's take the common factor at the front. So this is a row one. Now uh, let's take a row one on row two. Uh, so let's divide everything by row 2, so this becomes a row 2, this becomes um, row 1 squared, let's leave that for a second. What do we get? Row 2 on row 1, we get a 1 minus row 1 on row 2 equals, this just gives us a 1 um, minus row 1 on row 2. So yep, so if we divide everything by row 2, this gives us a row 1 on row 2. Let's go row 1 and row 2, row 1 and row 2. Uh, should that be squared? That should not be squared. Okay, um, and so it's the same game again. We can just cancel both sides of this, and we simply get that the row 2 on row 1, in this case for an isothermal shock, is simply equal to the Mach number squared. So in other words, for an isothermal shock, Row two on row two would go to in, row two on row one would go to infinity when the Mach number squared goes to infinity. All right, so um, you can have an infinite density contrast behind an isothermal shock. All right, that's all for now. So we're going to come back with a few more things. We're nearly done on the crash course in fluid dynamics. There's not a lot more to cover, um, but. Uh, we've covered now in the space of just two lectures the linear and nonlinear solutions, um, so we're well on the way to understanding the behavior of fluids. See. So